slash and cast. All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now, in this episode, I chat with actor and author Patricia Tallman about creativity, the supernatural, magic, movies, deadites, time travel, literature, and more. Also, I've made sure to include a link to Patricia's website in the description. As always, thank you all for listening. And without further ado, here you go. I don't want your book. I don't want your bullshit. Just send me back to my own time. Pronto, today. Boils and ghouls, this is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Patricia, so we have a platform to jump off here. Take us back in time to when you were a youngster. Okay. Are you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all the above? Oh my God, so much all the above. I definitely love building forts, but I, I built them so I could go read my books. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's, it, yeah, it's awesome. I, I'm a little bit of all of that. Uh, how about yourself? I bet you were too, huh? Did yes. you have a little bit of all of yes, that? Yes, I have, I have an entire wall of books over there. <laughs> Every, I think we all have a little troublemaker in us, you know? I hope so. That's, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so where whereabouts were you growing up? Um, let's see, mostly in central Illinois. Mm. And then we, as as I got older, we were moving closer to Chicago. Okay. And eventually I ended up going to high school right outside Chicago. So when it comes yeah. to books, did you have a genre or, or author that you lean more towards? Definitely. When I was very young, it would be Nancy Drew, Hardy Boys. <sighs> Uh, let's see. That, something called the Happy Hollisters, which I probably you wouldn't know. I don't know if you can see this, but I'm book. turning. There's my Hardy Boys line right there. No. <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> Justin. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> That's okay. So yeah, and then I got into the fantasy world, you know, uh, with The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, and off from there. Yeah, all the good stuff. All the stuff we love. <laughs> so when you do, when you think back to your formative years, what are some uh, films and TV yeah. that you were consuming that kind of helped mold your creativity a little bit? See, now you're very young. So when I was little, the you know, what was on TV was what was on. That was it. And there was no such thing as a VCR. You couldn't record it. Maybe there'd be reruns eventually, but you kind of had to watch what your folks wanted to watch because, of course, they were in charge of the television. So. <laughs> exactly. So I grew up watching Star Trek, the original series with my dad. We watched also a lot of Westerns because that was very popular then, Bonanza, things like that. And then variety shows were very big. And I loved like the Carol Burnett mm. show, the Smothers Brothers, Sonny and Cher, stuff like that. I, you know, I, I look back upon very fondly because that probably had a lot to do with developing my sense of humor. If yeah. You will. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and Star Trek, and then when one of the other shows that was really important to me when I was, let's say I was in middle school, I'd say was Dark Shadows. This was the, the original afternoon soap opera, Dark Shadows. It was so cheesy and so awesome. We would just like run home from school to get home in time to watch it. Because it was, like I said, when it, it was on when it was on. And if you missed it, you missed it. My mother was so lovely. She would... Some moms wouldn't let their kids watch TV until they had done their homework, but my mom would let me watch Dark Shadows, and then I could do my homework. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I say that it's so interesting. You see, kind of, we're talking about this stuff because I don't know if you're aware. I'm, I'm, I'm passionately into. I'm a huge nerd about personal development, and one of the things that 
I love to reflect upon is in when I used to watch Star Trek and I used to watch Dark Shadows, my cousins and I had Barbie dolls, of course. And we also had, I had a Francie doll, which was Barbie's little cousin, Francie, with the twist and turn waist, you know. <laughs> it was like this, this doll they were trying to get to take off and, and be as popular as Barbie. And we would take these dolls and we would play Dark Shadows and and Star Trek. So I spent like years of my life deep into role playing those shows, horror and sci-fi. Is it any wonder that my career hmm. became, you know, I really fell into those genres. It's just, it's really interesting because I think maybe your listeners might think, well, but of course, if you like horror and sci-fi, those are the shows you'd get hired on, but not true, Padawan. What really happens is, you know, you're lucky to get an audition and you audition for whatever you can get and you take the jobs you can get until you can build a career and then maybe be more choosy. But the jobs that I fell into in horror and science fiction, I wasn't able to cherry pick those jobs. That was just, I was really fortunate, but I also think that's where the mind over matter kind of stuff, the law of attraction, the true law of attraction, not the secret where you just wish it to be so and it appears on your doorstep. No, what you what your brain really does, the brain science behind, you know, how you manifest what it is you want. Focus on it, you obsess over it, you take action steps towards it, you work on the obstacles, you make it happen. I somehow did that, but I did it my whole life I did for as my in my growing years in single digits on up just decided that I mean I just was passionate about those shows and, and those genres I don't want to butcher the quote I don't know exactly who said it but it was essentially you know engulf yourself in what you love and that's basically yeah. that's basically what yeah. you're touching on yeah that's what it is and I I mean I really this is a huge mission in my life right now is that I want I want to help other people especially in our world. I call us a bunch of nerds. We're all nerds. And I, I'm just as big a nerd as anybody else. And I have my collections, you know, and I obsess over my shows and my actors and stars and characters. <laughs> Anything, you know. And I think that once you start to understand the brain science and what the brain is doing, what it's doing, it becomes really fun for people like us to then hack it hack the system and hack into our own way your brain works and say, oh, okay, this is old programming. I want this new programming. All right, how do I do that? It's not mysterious. I think it's more fun when it feels mysterious. I'm totally down with, you know, let's have the universe come in and make this happen. But it really is. It really is us. It's really us. And then if you like, then the universe can meet you on the path. But you have to mm. get into some kind of action. You have to work towards that, that dream that you have. So what's a dream that you have? A dream that I have. I I want to publish a novel, which I'm working (gasps) on. I love that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. (laughs) Excellent. So then you've got practical things that you need to do to make this to make this happen, right? You've got your steps you gotta take, you gotta get your butt in the chair and write, you gotta create. And then you have to find where you need to beef up your resilience, for example. Because you know there's gonna be times when it's hard. There's gonna be times when you feel like you don't wanna write. Right. There's going to be times when the ideas dry up. There's going to be times when your habits aren't serving you. There's times when maybe some people say some things. Oh, yeah, everybody wants to write a novel or it's really hard to get it published or never, you know. So you have people throwing their fear about themselves and their shit into your face. And it makes it hard to overcome that stuff. It is. It is. Have you always you had have, positive, magical way of thinking or did you have to train uh, yourself into it yourself? Yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't have it. I didn't know. I would. I just worked really hard, and I thought I was doing everything right. You know, as you do, you just as you're, you're trying to do life the way you were taught, or the way you figured it out, or you know, you try to be the right person you think you need to be, and do the right things that to get where you want to go. And I just worked really, really hard, and then I finally just hit a wall. I'm sure some people can kind of relate. You know, you get to a point where you realize that everything you're doing isn't working you know i've done everything i thought i knew how to do and it's not enough and i'm burnt out and exhausted and things aren't working and maybe worse you know your health collapses or you've had a you have a terrible breakup or you you know you get fired from a job you love and things just crash and burn all around you and often it kind of dominoes i don't know why life does that but it just often dominoes it's this and this and this and this until you finally cave as Mm -hmm. it were 
and that's when when it, when it, it all hit me over a period of time i finally just couldn't do anything else but admit that my best effort got me to the bottom of the pit of despair if you will mm -hmm. and um i didn't know what to do to make it work i think the good thing in all that was i became very teachable I became willing to listen to anything at that point. I was like, you just tell me what to do. Because clearly, I don't know. <laughs> clearly, <Yeah. laughs> this isn't working. I got really humble. And I love the, the word humble and humility. Because if you go back to all the roots of it, it really means earthy. And it means of the earth earthy so kind of that means getting really real and go back go back to your basics go back to learning again so i really started delving into this mind work now i can't really ex so i wonder where i started that but i could i had no money so i was like i bought a bunch of tony robbins cds in a garage sale and listened to them and and that was that was that was really helpful actually that was really powerful and then it was just the time when a lot of stuff was on the internet. This 2011, 2012, and you know, all these people were teaching and leading workshops. It was just starting to break that open a little bit. And some of the writers I was interested in were holding these workshops for free or for very little. And that helped a lot. And I just started to learn, you know? Yeah, one step in front of the other. So, and now that's what I'm doing a lot of myself, just trying to put that out there, create community around. Yeah. We could use more of that. We appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I think we need it because we meaning nerd because we love to learn and we love we love the stories we love. We love the genres we love. And so I like to put things in terms of those genres. Like I talk about the force, like Star Wars, and I talk about magic, like Harry Potter, and I I use references to Lord of the Rings and because I think that's why we love those stories. There's this piece in those stories that speak to us. And, and I believe it's partly because there's this something greater than ourselves. There's something bigger out there that we can tap into that really can make things better. I love it when people, when I'm talking to people about what, what it is I'm doing and they say, oh, that's so woo woo woo, that's so new age. I, you know, they want to poo poo it and yeah. discount it. And I say, you know, have you ever gone, oh my God? And they're like, yeah. I said, have you ever, you know, when you've really hit, you've gotten really, really scared or somebody's gotten sick, your baby, and something terrible is happening and you've gone, you prayed to something and you didn't even know what it was, or maybe you are religious and you're very particular, but you prayed because we hope there's something bigger than ourselves that we can appeal to to help us in these moments. I just personally believe that it, that if you look at how, look at the magnificence of our universe and the way the more we learn about physics and the more we learn about the universe and just how insanely complicated and beautiful it is that there was no mistake that you know scientists like einstein who became deeply spiritual at the more and more they learned they were like this is not a mistake then created all this something did and humans being humans we needed to we need to create story we need to make understanding around that and hence religion and that's all very important for people but i don't think you have to have any particular dogma to feel that awe about something made this and i i want to tap into that because first of all Maybe it'll help me. Maybe it'll keep me safer. Maybe it'll keep me from dying a terrible death. Maybe it'll help keep my family, <laughs> you know, and, and, and to be more, you know, pedestrian. Maybe it'll help my business to succeed. Maybe it'll help me to have a life of joy and happiness and connection. So, yeah, call it woo woo, but I believe everybody's got a piece of that somewhere. And, yeah. and you don't have to be religious at all. But it's more about, it's more about, wow, there's got to look at, look at all that. What? You know, right. Come on. To your point about yeah. woo-woo and such, I really mm. don't like looking at fiction or what, like you say, Lord of the Rings or any kind of thing like that, like escapism, because that should be how you want to feel. It shouldn't be something you're trying to escape from the real world and now I want to feel good. That's how you should feel all the time. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You put it so well, Justin. That's that, that kind of way. So I started wanting to, to create these experiences to help people kind of feel that awe that we we feel in those movies have go through that adventure but have it in real life because that's what we really want i think 
you know, that's why I think these movies are so addicting. Everybody wants to go because they don't think they can have that in real life. But I think you can. You just need a different kind of, you need to shift that focus. You know, we call it uh, the film industry racking focus, which means the camera is actually adjusting its focus. And it might, so you might be focused on that picture behind me hanging on the wall and you rack focus to me to bring me into focus or vice versa. You rack focus. That's what we need to do is rack our focus and take it off of the mundane and look at what is miraculous. And you can actually start to train your awareness to see the miraculous all around you all the time. And I, again, I I mean, I just was in Botswana for a couple of weeks. I'm in Cape Town. I'm in the Cape Town area now in South Africa. We saw, I mean, the animal life. You know, the thing for us in the United States, we don't wander around with elephants and impala and cheetah and, you know, baboons being part of our daily existence. <laughs> just, right. And when, by daily existence, I mean they're outside your fucking door. Yeah. <laughs> they're right there, guys. And you got, you, know, you have to have a protocol of how you live in the wild out here. And it, it just like changes your chemistry being in that experience where these animals are living their lives and dying and you could too you know <laughs> you're just a part of the whole scene but our guides were so good because they were talking about you know the smallest little bug and insect deserves all our respect for its part in this ecosystem because if one of these little guys gets wiped out around this you know everything starts to go to hell in a handbasket things start to fall apart everything has its purpose even if it's a dung beetle and its job is to roll up the poo. <laughs> That's its job. And it needs to do that. And here's why. And it, it's just, to me, it's amazing. It's amazing. And you can really start to let that in when you have, when you've racked your focus to the, the adventure we're living every bloody day. <laughs> Every day. Have you ever heard that saying where we're, we're standing on a rock, hurtling around a nuclear bomb, <laughs> we're just spinning, and we're not flying off into space. We're having this amazing experience. How can you right. not, you know, that kind of thing? That's, <laughs> yeah, I love that analogy. It's hilarious. Were your parents involved in the arts at all? Is that kind of what ushered you that way? They were, but I, I don't think that they ushered me that way, but I think they didn't get in my way mm. because of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. They understood that I got, I had the bug. Yeah, like I said, where I was just single digits, we were we were writing our own little scripts and creating our own stories. I had no idea that you know <laughs> this is a job or a career. We were just play acting. We were just having fun, and we would do musicals. We'd make songs. We'd you know all the stuff that kids do. It just for me never went away. And so I I think I finally had my first paying acting job when I was 15, 14 or fifteen. I just yeah for me it just never stopped. So my parents just kind of went yeah well. There's nothing we can do. <laughs> we have to let her do what she's going to do. I was taking dance lessons and things like that when I was little. That's all I wanted to do. Is there a eureka moment that you can point to? Maybe a specific play or performance hmm. you saw where you said, that's for me. Oh, interesting. I saw a play or a performance. I don't know that I did see one. I, I think it was more of a, a slow leaking in of mm. whether it was film and you know, the TV and then going to the movies. I remember seeing the sound of music with my grandfather like 11 times one summer because he just loved it. And in those days in the small town of Illinois, you know, they would, a film would come to town and stay for a really long time. That's just, I don't know why it did. And so we kept going back and seeing it. And I loved it. I mean, I absolutely loved it. I saw, I remember seeing in high school, I saw Liza Minnelli in concert and I loved her. I thought that she was amazing. That was the other big Big thing for us in those days were records, actual LPs, and it wasn't just music. There were a lot of comedy performers who had albums out and other kinds of performances, musical theater, of course, poetry. There was all kinds of stuff, and you'd hear it on records. So my dad was a disc jockey as one of his part-time jobs. We heard, listened to a lot of music and a lot of performances that way. So I think it just kind of seeped in, and it, yeah, it was never a question in my mind. I never even thought about it. So do you recall your, whatever you consider it to be, do you recall your very first time on stage, whether that be third grade or, you know, college? <laughs> <laughs> I think my best, my first real aha uh -huh and those are, are epiphany kinds of things was I did Barefoot in the Park in high school, a play by Neil Simon. And I think that was a moment of 
and just, you know, this, this light appeared inside my body and just lit me up. And I was outside of myself in a way. I just went, oh, my God, this is so amazing. And then I also did, it might have even been the same year, I also played the part of Rosie in Bye Bye Birdie, it's a musical. That was another one. That was another time. I completely forgot myself. I forgot mm. myself. I was into this thing I had created. Like we all do. We all do it. We, when we read a book or we're involved in a movie or some, we're watching a movie, we're in the world. We forget ourselves and we forget mm -hmm. we were in the world. And that's, that's, I think, something that actors are addicted to, forgetting themselves and being in the world. Oh, it's funny that you mentioned uh, losing yourself in that performance. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I spoke with uh, Armin Shimmerman. And I love Armin. Armin's great. Yeah, I love Armin. And he, oh, he's uh, amazing. He said, his, I asked him the same question I asked you, you know, your very first time on stage, how did it go? Mm -hmm. And his very mm -hmm. first time on stage was one of the one times in his career that he said he lost himself in the role. He can't remember the performance. Yes. And he said, that's how well it was. And that's kind of what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had that happen when I did Rosalind and As You Like It. Uh, Shakespeare. I was in New York. I was a professional actor at the time. I can't remember the show. I can't yeah. remember the performance. There's a couple of moments I can I can visualize backstage where there was a kerfuffle, costume piece that was didn't quite work or it was falling apart. We were improvising and I had I had really quick costume changes and I remember the tech that technical stuff, but I don't actually remember much about being on stage at all it's really amazing it's quite amazing i just find that interesting he said he's basically been chasing that yeah. since it happened but i just wonder what causes that and i think it's really unique to theater because it's hard in in television especially because working so fast and everything's broken up to bits you don't have time to lose yourself completely you know what i mean you you just have these few minutes to do this performance and yeah. then they switch angles and so it's it's interrupted the same thing with film i mean with film you the, you have more time of course it happens we see it happen we watch it we see those performances but yeah theater theater can happen on a regular basis you know why i think so many actors even once they become famous will go and do a play like for free just because of that feeling. As an actor, would you say it has something to do with the live aspect as well? Do you feel or feed off yeah, the audience? Totally. And it's, there's no safety net, right? So yeah. you've heard that too. It's very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> it's very dangerous. Yeah, so, yeah so there, that's a piece of it as well, for sure. So as an actor, does your approach differ depending on if you're playing that character on stage versus on screen? Yeah, it has to for a lot of reasons. You know, obviously there's the the camera sees into you so you don't need to do as much. You, all you need to do is really just try to get lost in what you're saying as much as you can or really be grounded in your work. And I also find that, it, of course, you have to know the whole script, but it's, it's really important to stay super focused just on that mm. thing that you're shooting. So I might not have memorized, you know, actually learned all the words for the next part part of what we're shooting but I am there for that part and then I have to let it go and move on to get to the next part but for the play a play you have you're holding the whole story in your head your whole character arc in your head and you might just you might flow through it focused at one thing at a time you have to stay in that moment but it's a very different skill set very, very different and uh, on stage too you are letting yourself be seen in a different way you are what they call more theatrical because your emotions need to be pushed out a little further it's almost like you have to create yourself you have to create your energetic field bigger and when you're on, when you're on camera you're actually letting the camera in you. So you're keeping your energy very close to you. It's kind of hard to explain. I bet Armin explained that. <laughs> no, no, that was fine. <laughs> okay. So for, for him as Clark, he was wearing all that prosthetic makeup. And it, it's helpful. Not my friends who, who have worn the prosthetics, like Andreas Katsoulis on our show on Babylon 5, as Jakar, you know, he said his prosthetics made him a better actor. Yeah. Because he said he he thought he was very hammy, you know, he was very big. And the prosthetics, you have to be big to be seen through the prosthetics. So I know that Armin is a very accomplished actor. I've watched him on stage. I've seen him I've seen him on 
television without his makeup, like on Buffy, for example. Or, and I've also seen him, of course, on Deep Space Nine. And I, you watch him, you don't even think about the fact that he's had to use a different skill every single time. He's had to like have a completely different job. He just does it seamlessly. Armin and uh, Andrew Divoff both said, you know, that it being in that like a uh, Wishmaster of the Gin, it helps you get to if you're deal, you're trying to portray this monster, it helps you seeing it in the mirror. Like this is what I am. I'm this ancient being. And oh, it's a lot yeah, easier for you to slip into it. Yes, I'm sure. Yeah, you just look in the mirror and you're there. <laughs> yeah, that would be. I, I had an army of darkness. I had some extreme makeup. I did. I was in a way. It's so liberating. You know, you're you're able to just pull out all the stops, man. There's especially when it's a character like that, a a demon or in my case, a witch. Yeah. You know, you're. Oh, you could. Just, I had, I had no idea that was you Dude. until later in life. <laughs> well, good. Because, <laughs> I mean, it was great. I mean, uh, that's uh, just while we we're on Army of Darkness, that scared the mm. crap out of me, you know, growing up. That that scene specifically, show. the the uh, oh, the witch really? scene. The yeah. I just think Bruce is amazing. I think Bruce Campbell is one of those actors. I don't understand why he's not a, a huge, massive star. I mean, he is to us. Yeah, I would say course. he is. <laughs> you know, he is. But he should have been, right? He yeah, I got you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was good looking, hilarious, a good actor. I mean, just in just doing his right. If he just wanted to play it completely straight, a great actor. I just don't get it. We'll take him, though. No. If they don't want him, we'll take we'll him. We'll take him. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Before we go too far away from stage, I wanted to ask if there was a theater director that you would love to work with again, if you could. Oh, wow. For a while, I was, I went to school. I went to school at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. That's where I studied acting. And a year or two behind me was this amazing, handsome, obviously very talented person named Rob Marshall. And I just, I loved Rob. He had so much fun. We called him Robbie. I was Patty and he was Robbie. He was not in my class, so I didn't get to hang out with him as much as I wanted to. But he was just had one of those personalities mm. you adore. And he became a famous choreographer and director. And he directed Chicago. He directed, wow. I mean, look it up. You know what I mean? He's got one of those crazy resumes. And I just would have loved to been in a musical he directed. Now it's too late for me. Never say you never. You know, back in my heyday. <laughs> I know, never say never. I could play, I could play Miss Havisham or something. In some kind of, you know, I could still play the witch in something, you know? Yeah. But I would, I would have loved to have worked with him. So how did that transition from uh, stage to screen happen for you? Was it a right place, right time sort of thing? I Let's see. I had just graduated Carnegie Mellon. I was 21, and I had gone to New York a couple months later. Or I, or I can't even remember exactly how long, but it wasn't long. I heard through the grapevine that George Romero was casting a film that George was from Pittsburgh. He was a very famous Pittsburgh director. He directed something called, a little movie called Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> and... This was called Night Riders. There was a role for a character in my age. I went to the woman I was freelancing with. She was my uh, freelance agent, which just means that they're not signed to you and you're not signed to them. You could work with other agents and they work with other actors. So I would bring things to them. And she really liked me and she was, I know she was, you know, hoping that I would become a big star. I brought this to her. I said, would you see if I could get an audition? And she got me the audition. Well, I'm sure it helped that I had Carnegie Mellon on the resume because George is all alma mater, right? Mm, right. I'd never met him, but I did get to audition for him in person in New York City. And um, just that alone was an extraordinary experience and I loved it. I think I had a callback, which is when an actor is that they're finalizing their choices mm -hmm. and they bring you back in either to have a more in-depth audition or maybe sometimes they have actors read together to see how they, the chemistry and I, I I just remember I don't remember the audition one of those moments right where you just be blank I, I remember going to the payphone back in those days we had pagers and payphones and called my mom and I said I got the part and my mom was like yeah and I said, I have a nude scene. She goes, we just won't tell your father. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. No, that was the first time I was on camera and I had to show my tits. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> that's just weird. You know, you're speaking of the law of attraction earlier that your first right. job is with George and then you end right? up Night of the Living Dead remake. So that's just I know. shows you. I'm telling you, it's just so strange. 
so strange. That wasn't a horror movie. So it was George right, Romero, yeah. but it was not a horror movie, right? It yeah. was Ed Harris. It was an Ed Harris film. And so I met all those guys. I met all of George's crew, and they'd worked together for years and years and years, and they continued to work together. And I worked with them again on Night of the Living Dead, 1990, when Savini directed it. So, yeah, it was just this kind of perfect little snowball that I didn't even know was in motion. Now, what I'm about to say might be sacrilegious to some horror fans, but I was born in 90, oh. so I do have a love and appreciation for George Romero's version, but Savini's version is my version. I prefer it Isn't to, that amazing? to uh, the original. So what did you think about his changes to Barbara and making her a badass? I, when, when Savini first said, hey, um, Patty, I'm doing, I'm doing the, the remake. I'm not living dead. Do you want to be in it? Do you want to be Barbara? I said, no, no. <laughs> I don't know. There's nothing in me that could be that woman. And Judy O'Day did such an amazing job. You know, I mean, she was amazing. She was perfect for that, that time. She was that time. It just, I, there's nothing in me. I couldn't even, I couldn't even pretend to like, oh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just, no. And he said, no, 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 no. Just read the script. And I read the script and I went, oh. But then I had to audition. So Marty Schiff, do you know Marty? I don't, do I don't. Marty? Okay, he's just part of that group he's, he's an amazing actor he became, now he's an acting teacher he's still part of the whole romero you know alumni or um, marty was in los angeles where i was living at the time and he said hey you, you know you want some help with your audition i said yeah i do yeah <laughs> so he read the part uh, uh they had me doing a couple scenes and one of them was when bill mosley and i were my you know johnny and barbara drive to the graveyard that argument that they have yeah so Marty was filming me with one of those big VHS cameras, you know, <laughs> with the big VHS tape in it and everything, filming me and reading the lines he was being yeah. Johnny when we did it right around a car. And, you know, then uh, and I, I might have even had another scene. But anyway, I, I did get it. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Obvious here. But we ended up, did, I did have to audition. The casting director didn't want me. She wanted somebody else. But Savini wanted me, and George was like, let's, of course, have Patty, of course. We're glad that they did. <laughs> I know. We're very glad. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about uh, Sam Raimi and like sort of how his uh, director style was compared to others you've worked with, if it stood out at all or anything you remember about him. I remember him being very, I don't know if he's actually shy, but he's very quiet and kind of feels like he's shy. Maybe he's mm. not, but he feels, you know, kind of has that vibe and doesn't really engage with you much until he's in front, he, he would be in front of us getting ready to direct the scene now for, let's see, did I do the Deadite stuff first or did I do the Witch first? I think I was a Deadite first. Yeah. And so I hadn't worked with him in a smaller scene yet. It was just the big scene with the Deadites. And he was on a megaphone to talk to everybody because we're outside in the desert at night with torches and horses and all this crazy <laughs> shit. And, and he's like, oh, I tell you, you scum of the earth. And he just went into this like, wow. Wow, you know, getting us all into character. <laughs> You're going to eat the tear apart. Like, wow, I'm this shy little, really quiet guy. Wow, went into this great. He's stirring us all up, cheering us on. It was awesome. Oh man, was I wish awesome. there was footage of that. <laughs> it was so cranky when I was doing the witch scene. I was in all that makeup and I had I even I had a hump on my back and the the wardrobe to hold everything on this hump had snapped at the crotch. It was one of those body suit yeah. things. And I had on my hands and upper arms, I had all this prosthetic makeup and these nails, right? They put those big, long, plastic, jaggedy nails on my fingers. And I couldn't undo the snaps to go to the bathroom, you know? <laughs> and I was in this makeup for 17 hours. Oh, my God. I had to jam those contact lenses into my eyes. It was like putting DVDs into my eyes every time. I mean, two, three guys were holding me down to get them up in my face. And I, it was, it was so hard physically the acting part was fun acting is fun getting shot was fun you know working <laughs> with Bruce is fun getting directed by Sam awesome right but the waiting around and the whole day was that was miserable in the end when we were actually working it was pretty amazing to be honest and I don't know if because most of the time I was blind <laughs> wearing these weird contact lenses. I couldn't see anything. <laughs> uh, 
I don't remember Sam again. I don't really remember. <laughs> I remember a few specific things. Like, you know, he would, I think it was because he was very quiet and very economical mm. with his emotion and energy. And he would he would just give me what he needed me to know and I would do it. And that was fine. You know, that was good. <laughs> and then we got to the fight scene part. I, I know I, I was doing the you shall die. You'll die. You know, Bruce is yeah. over there. So Sam said, you know, I want you to be, you know, just out of, what was the, kind of, what was he saying? Not cartoonish, but like you cannot go too far kind of thing. Right. And if you do, then we know. Then you've gone too far and I'll pull you back. But I want you to go as far. So I did this thing where I reared back and then I went after him and he loved it. He was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that, and I could hear him doing that. And then for when I was getting at the very end, I, and the witches are going to die, he said, I want you to do something amazing. You can do whatever you want. I want you to do something amazing. Now, you have to understand, it's been 70, 17 hours. <laughs> I was... I couldn't eat, I couldn't drink, I couldn't pee, and now, and I'm squibbed up, I have like 15 squibs on me. Now, squibs are, for your listeners, they are the little explosive blood bag devices that will, you know, be set off at the appropriate moment. So every time Bruce aims the shotgun at me, and maybe he actually, if I recall, he may, might have even been able to trigger and have a make the gun look and sound, maybe have a puff of smoke or something from the gun. We weren't using blanks because it was too dangerous, but we were too close. Hmm. But so he, we may have had, I can't remember exactly how we, must, we did it. Probably the camera was just on me for the actual squib part. So they just would, they would hit the, they would hit the charge. I would feel the little pop on me and I would react to it. So I knew it was my arm or I knew it was my leg or I knew it was, you know, and I would be doing all this kind of like dealing with shaking my body and reacting to the various gunshot wounds that were one right after another. Couldn't see anything. I didn't know what to do. Like, how does a witch die after being shot a million times with no special effects? So in those days, this is 1994 and, and a budget. We're on a tight budget, right? So the only thing I could think of was I just fell flat forward on my face, right? It just kind of did just a pl- prat fall right on my face. Mm-hmm. And Sam did that again. I <laughs> <laughs> and I, I like a couple of weeks later, I was uh, I got had some messages on my answering machine. This back in the day, we had pagers answering machines <laughs> and cell phones. We uh, not no cell phones, but Sam and Bruce had one of those big boxy 1990s cell phones that were the size of a shoebox, mm-hmm. right? They were like these big walkie-talkie things, and they called me from the car. They had just edited that scene, and Sam was like, "You were my." favorite monster ever that was amazing you know so and i oh justin if i could have only kept that you know if i only <laughs> still had that tape and it just was brought me such joy i was first of all so amazed that they had called me and second of all that you know because i was a great monster that was a new one for me you know? I hadn't had a chance to be a monster. That was pretty cool. The witch in Army of Darkness is one of the tops, you know. <laughs> if nobody's ever told you that, you were great, you know. It was. Oh, thank you. The people often mistake me uh, for, and they they say that I was the witch at the end, too. And I wasn't. I was just the witch with the cauldron, stirring the cauldron. And yeah. So straightening straight the mat up for everybody out there. I don't know who that girl was. But kudos to her. She was amazing. But that was all good. I wasn't me. How long That's did you I spend know. in makeup? <laughs> totally. By the time. It took them took them like four and a half hours to get me into that makeup, and it took them a good two and a half to get me out. <sighs> oh my god! And we are out in. Let's see, where were we for that? Were we still in Acton? Anyway, I had an hour drive home after that too. It's like <laughs> middle of the night. I was oh fuck, it was awful. <laughs> I, I really have no desire to ever do anything like that again. But it was awesome, and I'm glad I did it for Sam and for Bruce. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I'll say that. <laughs> Patricia, of course, science fiction fans will know you from Babylon 5. Um, what are your memories of that set when you reflect back? You know, oh, What comes to mind? So many. So many, so many, so many. I, you know, uh, we were so lucky to be able to do that for a lot of reasons. We always, I mean, I always go back to the camaraderie because the, the group, that cast and that crew was so extraordinary. And I don't necessarily mean talented, but well, of course they are and were that course. But I was working on 
Paramount. I was working on Deep Space Nine and Next Generation at the same time we were doing Babylon 5. I was on all those sets and mm. just didn't talk about it. You know, one day I would be leading Alexander, the next day I'm doubling Terry Farrell. And, uh, you know, that just was my yeah. life. So I saw the different sets. I have been working in Hollywood for a long time and running around as a stunt woman. I'm on a lot of sets. And I knew how special the Babylon 5 team was and never for a moment took that for granted. It was really such a relief to be able to go to work. My, my son was, in, was very small when I started back on the show and mm. he grew up, you know, his, his single digit years were on set, on and off the set. So it, it was a really profound time. I'm st still good friends, you know, with, with everybody. I, you know, I, it's hard to describe that. I think that you may hear it from people like Armin because I know the Deep Space Nine crew and cast are very close. Mm -hmm. I'm still good friends with the Visitor, who I doubled as her stunt person. So, yeah, I mean, I, it, was, it was very powerful. Did you ever yeah. work with Armin across any of those shows? Because you guys have I a lot of mix. Yeah, yeah. I was in the makeup crew with Armin several times. Mm. While he was getting into the park and they were putting me into whatever alien I was at the time. I don't remember why we were... I think we just knew some people in common and he was just immediately so kind and like mm. welcoming and uh, we just, I just felt like, oh, we're friends. And I wasn't always treated that way on sets because of being a stunt person, I was considered less than. And maybe because actors can tend to be um, protective of themselves and their relationships and that's fine. But Armin was very welcoming and always just really, really just, you know, and I've, I've called him and asked him to be part of things that I was doing and he He's always been very generous that way. Very yeah. nice, very nice guy. I wanted to ask you about your book, Pleasure Thresholds. Was that your first oh. venture into writing ever? <laughs> yes. I didn't want to write a book, but I was broke. And I got this phone call out of the blue, seemingly. And it, uh, this woman named Jacqueline Easton. And she said, hi, I'm Jacqueline. I, I am the, what does she call herself? A producer, which she's, she like runs and created B5 books and had produced all of Joe's script books and the writing of for Babylon 5. And she said, I wanted to create something that was a little more fan friendly. That would be, I don't know what she said, but maybe have some pictures. And Joe said, you were really obnoxious on the set with your camera. So I was wondering if you'd be <laughs> interested in putting together a book. And I was like, you know, when you're, this is another thing I've learned in the, 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 uh, the whole manifesting process is when you're saying, oh, my God, I need money or I need help. When anything comes along, you say yes, even if you don't want to. And so it's like, will you write this book? I'm like, yes. <laughs> yeah. OK. <laughs> so they, they were she she sent over Jason Davis, who is a very accomplished writer and editor. And he and his wife, Cynthia, helped me go through my photos. And we picked like 350 photos. I have a lot of photos from all my time. <laughs> and, he, and then and he said, great. I said, OK, great. See you. Thanks. Bye. You know, kind of thing. And he said, no, 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 no. We need to caption all these photos. Like, who are these people? All right. So then I would write a few sentences about each photo. Right. And it was grueling. It's like pulling teeth. And then Jacqueline called me up. This is so great. What we got to do is and uh, we have to write a story. You got to tell the story of this photo. <laughs> so I told the story of one photo. That's it, right? And then before I know it, I'm writing all these. Yeah, the whole stories. book. <laughs> <laughs> so they kind of snuck it into me and pulled it out of me. You know, but I'm really glad that that I did it. Of course, it was important to do. And I, one of the things I found while I was doing it was I enjoyed the pro I enjoyed the my time on Babylon Five even more because when I was shooting Babylon Five, I was working so hard and going 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 not sleeping i had an infant i had working on deep space nine and this and i uh, did the film for generations and all, you know all this stuff constantly going on i had no time to revel in it and mm. to really enjoy it because i was just always worried about something and writing a book about it gave me the luxury of looking back over all my call sheets and all those photos and thinking about those people and i called people too and just like oh yeah that was that was amazing you know that was pretty cool I can't believe I did that. Oh, yeah, I didn't sleep for three days in a row. <laughs> I just kind of forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's still out. And I just did it. Well, not just, but we like last year or so, 20, 
21, I did 2020. I did a um, an updated version. I'm think I really want to do a color version, so I'm trying to figure out how to do that. But do you uh, do you think you'll write again? I've got a rough draft of a book that it has more of my stunt work in it, and I have. I have hundreds of pages on personal development work that, you know, things I've put together to teach and that I want to share. And I've, I've been, what a part, one of the things I'm doing here in South Africa right now is just writing because I'm putting together a program and, and I have to write all this copy for emails and all this other stuff. I, oh my God, it's just never ending. So <laughs> I've become a very reluctant writer and I have no, I have no illusions about my talent in this direction. <laughs> My goal is to be lucid. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the goal. If you can understand the sentence, it's a win. It's a plus thing. <laughs> <laughs> Whether there's a yeah, total plus. I don't have to worry about that at all. <laughs> so, uh, Patricia, when you reflect over your career, whether it be stage, screen, whatever, what's the most challenging mm. role that you've worked on? What kept you up at night? Where did you pull your hair out over? Ooh, 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 ooh. Rosalind doing Shakespeare, that was that was the, because it's a massive role. And Rosalind, in the course of the story, it goes in drag. She pretends she's a guy for part of it. And she has to keep going in and out of these characters. It was it was interesting because, as of course, as a woman, she wouldn't have been allowed to do X, Y, or Z. So she had to pretend she was a man and to do it. And that I loved that story, and it was that was an amazing experience, challenging. I think Barbara in Night of the Living Dead was especially important to me because I was being trusted with this by Tom and George, and and my take on it was going to be so different. Mm -hmm. I want, I, you know, no matter what a creator says about, you know, I want you to do put your own mark on it, that there's often pushback when you do, you know, just kind of, it is, it happens, yeah. but they, they yeah. never did. They, they really did just want to see me be me as much as possible. So that was, that was really important to me to just show up a hundred, a million percent. I mean, uh, with everything I had to do, and I think I did. I you did. Really tried. Thank you. And then Babylon Five was important to me as well. It was harder for other reasons, but I really was so grateful for the challenge. That part of it was, that, you know, I just my self worth was in the toilet. Mm. So it's really hard to rise to an occasion when you don't have any self worth. I didn't realize that was the deal of course I, it was part of what ultimately led me to this what i'm doing now because i had to go through that crash and burn and just like uh, realize okay none of this shit works what, what i'm trying to do obviously my belief systems are off and so babylon 5 was really wonderful and people were not coming to me i'm not saying that they were <laughs> i'm just saying that it was myself showing up with heart i met so many important people on that show for me personally, that was really remarkable. Stunt jobs could be hard in that it's sometimes the stunt coordinator thinks they know what they're asking of their stunt people, but often the job might entail something quite different. So mm. they'll say, hey, you're running along here, you gotta jump over that, and then they're gonna throw a bucket of water on you or something like <laughs> that. I don't know, when I'm just being stupid. <laughs> and what you're doing is you're running along, and they, for, they didn't tell you because it's a different department, but explosives will be going off mm. while you're running. <laughs> oh, and then the smoke gets in your eyes and you can't see. <laughs> while you're running and oh they're shooting plastic pellets and you get dinged by them while you're trying to run <laughs> why did you look so herky-jerky when you were running for like that it's like while you were shooting things at me and i couldn't see shit like that oh my god yeah that does yeah. sound challenging so, I'm, just, I'm just you know being a little silly but honestly it's that kind of stuff that happens that you, you show up and you think you're doing one job and that turns out to be oh my god i did a, um, a job where i was supposed to be doubling the actress and she is breaking out of prison this was a true story one of those sappy like weird true story shows they did <laughs> back in late 90s or whatever they were on all the time in the line of duty or one of those i can't remember it was the something something story of this real woman and they said, yeah, you just have to, you're going to break out of prison. So I'm imagining that it's, I'm going to be picking locks <laughs> or I'm going to be sneaking behind guards or so. I mean, how do you break out of prison? Are you digging with a spoon? What are you doing? They had me climbing a 20 foot chain link fence and then it has barbed wire on the top. 
And they said, well, what would you do? I said, not do it. <laughs> I went, and they said, well, she threw her, her jacket over it and tied it down with a belt and then got over. And I said, okay, and that's what I'll do. <laughs> Doing that, and it which feels like it's taking 45 minutes. You know, I mean, it's taking 10 minutes. Whatever it's taking, it's taking forever. But then I have to fall down on the other side. It's like 20 <laughs> feet. You know, you die. What the hell? Oh, man. You just have to, we'll fix it in post. Yep. There you go. I need that on a shirt. <laughs> This is something I like to ask everyone, Patricia, because you never know what folks are going to say. Uh-oh. Have you ever had an experience that you would consider supernatural or paranormal? Oh, yes. Often. A lot. Ooh. I've seen ghosts. I've heard them. I've watched them move things. Uh, uh, I've had voices talking to me. Hi, That's what a lot of psychopaths say, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but nothing. I mean, it wasn't telling me to do anything. It's just like shit. Yeah, no, no. I think it's totally, absolutely a thing. I, I think that there's one day we'll understand it. They'll be, mm. you know, able to prove it to the naysayers. But I just think that some energy gets caught, either caught in their personality. There seems to be a couple different kinds of ghosts. For example, there's ghosts that always shows up on midnight at Halloween where they were killed at a crossroads, right? And and it just every Halloween, there she is in her white dress, gets smashed by a train. We see it we see it every Halloween, right? It happens all the time. I when I went to school in Pittsburgh, we would sometimes as kids go camp you know, as young people go camping in the woods in Pittsburgh, between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, there's nothing but forest. <laughs> like forest. <laughs> now now maybe there's some farmland. But it, it is really spooky. And we would go off into the forest, which was probably not too smart. A lot of horror movies start off. Yeah. <laughs> and camp or whatever, and there you'd hear all these horror stories about things like that. Oh, the woman in white, or this murder happened here, and you hear the screams and, and all that kind of stuff. And so to me, I think that could be like something, energy got stuck. And yeah. so it's kind of on a loop. It doesn't seem to be personality driven so much. It's just like this moment in time that got stuck. And then there is the personality driven version. I was in a medieval castle in France and they had turned it into a very exclusive little hotel and restaurant. And I was there with a boyfriend and had a very nice, you know, dinner and then going to sleep. And I wake up and I'm paralyzed. The room is completely freezing cold. I can see my breath and I feel hands on my feet and I can't move. And I'm trying to wake up my boyfriend. Going, huh, uh, uh. You know, they call that that night. What do they call it? Night that? terrors. Night terror? yeah. yeah, like a night terror. So I, it's easy to explain away to say, oh, you were having one of those. No, I wasn't. This thing crawled up on me and was breathing in my face and I could see him. I could see him very clearly. He kind of looked like a Picasso. Like I could see through his face and one eye was a little closer and the other was back here. And he's going, <laughs> oh, no. my face. And I was like, finally went, oh, you know, and I woke everybody up. <laughs> the room is freezing cold. My boyfriend went, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so the next day we, were, we walked down to the desk and I said, and my boyfriend spoke French and he said, um, was there anything going on in that room you know, that we should know about? Or I was, what? What? No, 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 no. And so we turned around and I'm walking away and there was a maid and she goes, oui, that is the count. It's very naughty. Oh, no. <laughs> he does around terrorizing women. I mean, there's a personality in yeah, that. Yeah. You know, that was a personality. So then I've also experienced, also in the woods of Pennsylvania, camping a little later in life. I got, I was leaving my tent to go to the loo. They had campsite loos, right? So and it's it has there has there's spotlights or whatever you know there's light. It's spotlit, spotlit over by where the loos the loos yeah. are. So I have to come out through the shrubbery for our campsite, <laughs> get on the little path and go to loo. And I'm trying, I'm going through the shrubbery and it's dark and I don't find a path. And there's a lot more shrubbery than I remembered. And I'm like trying to get through the shrubbery, going, where the fuck's the shrubbery? <laughs> I got lost, I've turned around. And then I'm hearing, I'm hearing like what sounds like drums and singing. And then I realized I was singing, hey, it sounded very indigenous people in that I was like, clearly, this is the, the, the in, there's an indigenous tribe here and they're having a moment. I'm hearing very clearly. And I wasn't freaked out. I was just kind of annoyed that they turned off the lights 
<laughs> for the, the indigenous tribe and didn't tell me, you know, and so I'm wandering <laughs> around trying to figure out where I am. And, and then, I don't know, I kind of broke through the shrubs and all of a sudden the lights are back and there's a path. And I turn around and my tent is right there. Now I've been walking through shrubs for like 10 minutes in the dark, hearing this music. And suddenly it was all gone and I'm right back where I was started from. So I go to the bathroom and I come back. And I kind of tell my boyfriend that I'm that, hey, this just happened. And he was asleep and, and brushed it off. But when we were leaving, there was another group there who had been camping. And they said, and of course, I didn't go back to sleep that night. And they said, how was that? I, I didn't sleep. There this weird thing. And I heard, I thought I heard drums and chanting. They go, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like a portal. It happens every once in a while. I was like, what? And they said, well, I, we don't know. It's just like sometimes that happens where you wander through and you're like in a different age. It, it, you're back in time. You went back in time. I said, well, I don't think I went back in time. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but maybe there's a, some kind of a there's some kind of an explanation again about some trapped energy that kind of comes forward again. Or maybe it's like Einstein said, that time is not linear, it's bundled. So right. at any time, you can cross over into another... You sort of you to step sideways into something else. That, almost, you know? That's right. So, <laughs> I, you know, so I've had these weird experiences. I could, t- I could talk like this all night, but I don't have any explanation. And I think it happens all the time. Yeah. And sometimes we're just not aware of it or we have explanations for it or, you know, we're half asleep. So we go, oh, I was I was half asleep. You know, why do you ask? I was going to say, Patricia, you just proved why I ask. <laughs> this is why okay. I ask everybody that right. question. You know, I mean, you just want to hear a story. I have my own beliefs and thoughts, but it's just mm-hmm. it kind of helps validate yourself and make you not think you're crazy if you hear other people have uh, had weird strange things happen you know absolutely i don't think you're i don't think you're weird i don't think it's of the devil i don't think it's you know i don't think it's anything but natural and it's hard to explain and that makes makes us feel like there's maybe something wrong with us or there's something to be afraid of and i don't think it's either one of those things i think right. it's just we just don't really quite know yet and it's totally fine and uh, speaking you know, towards I, the magical I, thinking I, from earlier just bring the supernatural into it and there you go it's just that's just right. another thing that's right that's right and then why not have it just be part of life that's just how it goes and i, I think that makes it way more interesting yeah doesn't it yeah, yeah i'm having an adventure right now i'm just trying to go to the bathroom but i am <laughs> having an adventure <laughs> You could have potentially went back in time just trying to go to the bathroom. You know, that's that's pretty cool. Why me? <laughs> Can you wait till after I pee first, you know? <laughs> okay. Well, Patricia, I guess just to put a bow on everything, I kind of kept you kind of long. Oh, uh, I appreciate it, though. It's fun talking to you. Well, you're letting me yak away. I appreciate that. <laughs> just to wrap up, <laughs> tell folks where they can find you and what you have on the horizon and all that good stuff. Oh, I so would love to. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> I am getting ready to launch a year of magical living the science of magic and it's going to be a year with me uh i built a community on a platform called circle so why i did this was because i i I tried patreon and i didn't i didn't have the interaction with everybody i wanted to have and facebook where you could all have this interaction, of course, is Facebook. And I didn't want that. I didn't want that distraction. I don't want that negativity. So I I found a new platform and I really, really, really love it. I'm putting together, for lack of a better word, masterclasses on topics. And then we have a topic every month. And then we have special guests come in, like Nana Visitor comes in on a regular basis and talks based on the topic. And we have Q and A, and we have all this other fun, and we have fun stuff like we have game night, we have watch parties. So I've created a community of nerds who are into this personal development stuff and want to talk about various things. Want want to feel safe because often I think that in life, like my family doesn't get me at all, right. and I love them, and I know they care about me. But if I talk about this stuff, they want to give me some extra pills. <laughs> like here, you need. Yeah. Go to this doctor. You know? I, I, so I, I think we all need a place you can go and feel safe about exploring these, like changing, because people get freaked out too. When you change yourself, it somehow reflects on them. And anyway, that's a, that's a whole conversation <laughs> too. Anyway, so I've started this and I'm going to be launching it at the end of this month or beginning of February. It, I'm doing a free master class called How to Tame Your Fear Dragon. So please check out, if you go to my Instagram, patriciatolman.rocks, 
on Instagram. You'll see a place to sign up eventually. We don't have it up yet, but we'll have it up in the next week, 10 days. And then the, the, and it'll be running for a while until we get until mm-hmm. we get it all. Uh, I think we're going to actually do the live thing in March. But yeah, that's what I'm doing. Thanks for asking. <laughs> and I'm also traveling. I've sold my house and we're traveling, my husband and I. And we don't know when we'll settle down. But we're in Africa now, probably Europe in the second half of the year. Well, yeah. safe travels. Thank you. Yeah. Don't have anything else for you. I want to thank you very much for giving me some of your time this morning slash evening. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for having me, Justin. It's been really fun, and I wish you well. And I appreciate you giving me a chance to to share what I'm up to. Yeah, let us know. We'll we'll share away. All right. Thank you, Patricia. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Right, bye, bye, Justin. Bye bye. Be well. All right, folks. That's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed that chat with Patricia. As always, thanks for listening, and we'll see you back next time. Monsters, madness, and magic. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.